Welcome back to Adult Bible Study Online for our third week in a row. And we're glad to be with you and we appreciate you listening and hope that, that it's been a help to you. I know it's a little different than we planned when we started this series in our new Sunday school. We were all excited about it and we split off into different classes. We're all studying the same thing and little did we know we'd be doing a round table um, isolated at home and uh, you watching online. It's been different, but I hope that it has been a help to you. And I know it's for these us guys here, it's been a help studying this and just talking through it. We probably spent 30 minutes just now trying to figure out uh, after we've all studied individually, now we got to come back together and make it all work for you. And so I hope that it uh, is clear. We just spent a time in prayer just a second ago and we want, we want it to be clear for you and uh, an overflow of the excitement that we have from studying it. So today in the study, we are in John chapter 18. And John chapter 18, we're really going to focus around three scenes. Let me quickly set the scene, and then we're going to begin reading, and then we'll get started. Scene number one is going to be verses 1 through 11. In, they're in the garden. They've made their way out of the upper room. They made their way into the garden, and that is where that Judas is going to betray Jesus. And we're going to break that down a little bit and talk about it. And then scene two today is kind of like a movie. you got a scene, and then we're going to move, and then scene two is going to be, then Jesus, after he's betrayed, he's going to be taken. And he's going to be seen, and I'll explain that here in a little bit, of, of the Jews, and then scene of the Romans, and we're going to break that down a little bit. And then scene three, we're going to, we're going to come back to Peter. And the Bible focuses on Peter, and we're going to see why and what takes place. So we've got three scenes for you today. We're going to get started right now. John chapter 18, verse 1. Brian's going to get us started with a little bit of reading and some breakdown of this text. All right, so follow along in your Bible, um, and let's read verse 1. It says, When Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the brook Kedron, where was a, where, where was a garden in the which he entered and his disciples. I find it interesting here uh, that they're in a garden. This is Jesus who in the New Testament you'll know is often uh, or is sometimes called the last Adam. Uh, so the first Adam, he, he took place in a garden. He met an enemy and, and uh, he, he failed. He, he gave in to the enemy. And here we find the last Adam, Jesus, meeting an enemy in the garden. He will triumph. Um, some irony there. But let's read on verse number two. What it says, And Judas also, which betrayed him, knew the place, for Jesus oft times resorted thither with his disciples. Verse three, Judas then, having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, cometh thither with lanterns and torches and weapons. And so it's interesting, they say a band of men was definitely pro, uh, definitely over 100 men. It could have been 200 men, could have been as many as 1,200 men. Uh, but in my mind, I see about 200 men here coming with Judas to meet Jesus. Uh, and it's interesting that they're coming with uh, lanterns and torches uh, to meet Jesus, the light of the world. That's some more irony there. But let's read on verse 4. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, Whom seek ye? And they answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus saith unto them, I am he. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. As soon then as he had said unto them, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground. Uh, we didn't talk about this beforehand, but I find that verse very interesting there. All Jesus said was, I am he, to some 200 men, and his power of his speaking there, knocked them to the ground, which is also interesting when you see what they're about to do to him. Verse 7, and then asked he them again, whom seek ye? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. If therefore you seek me, let these go their way, that the saying might be fulfilled, which he spake of them, which thou gavest me, have I lost none. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and smote the high priest. Uh, servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Then said Jesus unto Peter, Put up thy sword into thy sheath. Uh, the cup which my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? All right. Now, were you going to say something else? No. Sorry. No, no, no. I didn't mean to jump in, man. I was getting fired up, though. I want you to think about this because when you read the Bible, I, I hate when people read the Bible and it's just like, and then this happened. And, and, and you at home, not Brian, not that Brian did that. I'm saying when we read the Bible, it's like the story we've already heard. you got to put yourself in this. This is an action flick right here. I mean, this is action-packed. 
Here it is. Jesus was just a few hours ago with Judas. And now Judas is coming in with 200 plus people or 200 or so people. And here they come with all this, this intimidation. And there's Jesus. And he says, he says, I am he. And I think some more of that I am to add to that. It's when he said the word I am, the Jews were yeah. like, whoa, he is claiming to be a deity. They fall back. And then he said about Peter taking the sword and cutting him out. I mean, this is an action pack scene. So Brian Walden, let's jump to you, junior high teacher. Uh, you build this Thanks scene for, for us. What, what are you What are you thinking on this? Uh, up when you read this this early passage. Well, right away, um, what really got me was um, just the setting of where this is getting ready, where this is taking place. Um, you know, Second Timothy three sixteen we know says that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, is profitable for uh, uh, for doctrine, for reproof, cor- for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So no word or any phrase is in the Bible by accident or mistake. It's all there for a purpose. And so when he's talking about um, the the brook uh, Kidron, Kedron, however you want to say it, um, that that translates into Black Brook. Um, and so the, in in this valley that where it's near the Temple Mount, this brook um, had kind of became like a sewage area. Um, and why it's important is this area really has been tied to, in the Old Testament, um, times when when they would uh, cleanse the temple, basically. Um, so in First uh, Kings, Asa burnt the idols that his mother had set up. He burnt them and, and threw the the ashes there. And then and, uh, and then also um, Athaliah, I think I think that's how you say her name. Uh, okay. King Ahab's daughter, who had become queen. And, mm-hmm. and set up, started Baal worship in Judah. Um, that's where they executed her. Mm. She was executed there. Um, and uh, then later on, if you read in Second Chronicles and some other passages, it, 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 it leads and, sh- and points out how they changed, how they turned this into, like I said, like a sewage area. Um, and so it was, it was attached with defilement and, and death and dirt. Um, and also, what's significant is that in the temple, the altar, there was a channel, a canal, where, that, where the blood of the lambs that were sacrificed would drain down into this uh, brook. And it was normally dry, but when the water would come through, it would give it like a black appearance. Hmm. And so the things that I was reading is how it, it, it kind of depicts uh, sin and defilement. And so here, um, you know, in this place of darkness and death, defilement uh, we see that Christ the second Adam the last Adam the perfect holy lamb is crossing over this sin he, he's he's going to the garden to finish the work to make the final sacrifice to pay for sin once and for all um, so and, and so that really is what popped out to me uh, and I just thought thought it was really cool um, and I didn't realize how much I was going to enjoy looking up the historical parts of it and just the history of the places and the people surrounding this. Yeah. Amen. Great thought there. Matthew, yeah, I had a, going on verse, just an overall, I hit on three verses here and, and I'm like, I don't know which one I want to share. I got one on four and six. I mean, this could, could, should kind of be like how you're studying your Bible. I mean, it's not like, I mean, Brad did, you know, graduate from a Bible college pretty much. But outside of that, I mean, it's not that, that we are Bible scholars here and we're able to find these things. It's We're searching it. And it it should be that you are, I mean, the hardest thing, like Brad said, is 30 minutes of trying to figure out who's going to talk because we all have these things that we just want to throw in there. I said the other night when I was preaching, I run all the time in the other room. Dominic, 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 did you know this was there? So I'm going to share one and I'm going to kick back in later. But verse 4, I saw a phrase there. It said three times, verse 4, verse 7, and then a version in, in verse 8. Whom seek ye? It's neat here. It's one of those pictures of, of course, Jesus knows what's happening. He knows that they're coming for him. You know, it's almost like Adam. You know, Adam's hiding after the sin, and then God's like, where, where art thou? And, you know, he's, of course, he knew where Adam was, but he, he, he wanted Adam to answer it. It's the picture of the three times he asked Peter, lovest thou me? You know, he, he knew where Peter was. He knew that Peter did emotionally love him, but he was not at a place where he would physically fall that in action. And here, 
It's just one of those neat ones for me. Christ is saying, whom seek ye? He's saying, are you, you're looking for me? It's just that thought of they weren't really looking for Christ. You know, they were there on pretty much the power of Satan. You know, if they were really looking and drawing close to Christ, they would not be there doing that act. And many times I think God knows the answer, but when we're about to do something and we're covering it up and, you know, thinking that we're still, you know, still doing the Christian thing, we're still going to church, all those things. And he's like, whom seek ye? You're really seeking after me and you're, and you're doing this? You know, so it's that, right. it's that over and over question that Jesus knows the answer, he, but he puts it yeah. out there because he wants us to know that mm-hmm. same answer. The answer was, you know, they were not looking for Christ because mm-hmm. he was open and available to them, as he right. says. And I, I was there with you. I was in the villages. Why do you come out with the 100, 200 men with, you know, staves and, wood and all these things trying to attack me? I was here. You could find me anytime. Yeah. So just an interesting uh, where mm-hmm. in verse 4, you can look it up. Just for the sake of time, I won't tell you, but whom seek ye in verse 4, 7, and then 8, he refers to the kind of the same way and a little bit different wordage there. All right, I'm going to stick with verse 4, and I've been excited about this little nugget right here, so I want to share it with you. I want you to listen to verse 4 again. I want you to think through this. It says this in verse 4, Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him. What does he mean when he says that? What does the author mean? Jesus, therefore, knowing what? Knowing you're going to be betrayed by your friend that you've invested time into. Knowing that you're going to be denied shortly by a friend you invested time into. Knowing that your Heavenly Father is going to turn His back on you. Knowing that you're about to be beaten. Knowing that you're about to be mocked. Knowing that you're about to be spit upon. Knowing that you're about to be stripped and humiliated. Knowing that you're about to be crucified and the crown of thorns put on your head. Knowing all of that, it says, went forth. Man, that gripped me last night when I was reading through this and studying. I thought, you know what? If, if I would have known all of those things that Jesus knew, I wouldn't have went. There's no way. And before you sit there and think, because I would have thought this too back in my day, I would have thought, well, he's Jesus. He's God. It's not a big deal. Hold on. He was 100% man and 100% God. Mm-hmm. So he felt yeah. the betrayal. He felt yeah. the, the, the rod. He felt the nails. He felt being humiliated and stripped and crucified yet he went forth and I was sitting there on the porch last night thinking this thinking through this and studying this and I thought why would he do that and I put two thoughts number one his love was greater than his fear of pain he had such a love for mankind he had to go forward he loved us and he knew that his purpose was to die for our sins that's why he came here and so knowing that he went forth um, and I think about the, the application to our lives. There's sometimes when, when we know that if we do this, whatever it may be, mm-hmm. that we know that God wants us to do, it's going to bring pain. It, we know that, it, well, if I invest in people or if I try to make friends at church or if, if I try to disciple them, I may be hurt. I may be let down. They may turn their back on God. And so some people say, well, I'm just not going to do it then. I'm just going to st- stick to myself because they don't want the pain. They're afraid of the hurt. I'm not going to tell others about it. I'm not going to forgive that person, even though I know that I want that I should. I know the Bible tells me to, but that may bring me pain. Jesus, knowing that there was going to be pain, went forth. Then I'd say the second reason he did it was because his desire to obey his Father was greater than the perceived comforts of disobedience. Now again, you could say, well, this is God. He couldn't disobey. Okay, I see what you, the argument you're trying to make there, but there was a lesson for us. He's a hundred percent man. And he said, knowing what was going to come, he went forth. And you know, in our lives, it ought to be that we have such a desire to obey God that even if it's uncomfortable, even if it's possibly painful to whether our ego or or physically or whatever it may be, that we say, I'm going to move forward instead of enjoy the perceived, I put perceived on purpose in my notes, the perceived comforts of disobedience. Because it's for a while, disobedience looks good. Jonah was fine on the boat for a while. Mm -hmm. And then everything went crazy. And so I love that little verse right there. When it, Jesus, having known what was going to come, he still went forth. Why? Because he loves us. And that was a challenge to me to have the same mindset when it comes to him. Well, I mean, maybe you are thinking, well, I can't relate to Jesus. I mean, he's perfect and I'm not. Well, 
so let's look at Peter real quick. And, and Peter, we can certainly relate to Peter because he messes up. And, mm -hmm. and we are going to probably be pretty hard on Peter here, especially later. Uh, so let me give him some credit here. If you look down in verse 11, where it said, then, then said Jesus, or verse 10, then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and smote the high priest servant, cut off his right ear. Uh, now, we could argue whether he should have been there, whether he should have obeyed and not even been there in the first place. Uh, uh, but you gotta, you got to appreciate his zeal. And I love uh, reading on the thought of zeal. A zealous man is a man of one thing. And Peter, uh, I think you gotta, you got to give him credit for he, he was passionate about one thing. And a zealous man, he only sees one thing. He only cares about one thing. He, uh, he lives and is swallowed up by one thing and that one thing is to please God and and uh, you know for a zealous man it doesn't matter whether that means sickness or health uh, it doesn't matter whether you get praise for it or you get blamed for it whether everybody likes what you're doing or whether you're offending people a zealous man just wants to please God and, and uh, I think it's a good lesson and challenge to all of us you know on just uh, Peter's zeal he's going to make a mistake his zeal you, you want to have knowledge with zeal and you want to do wise things and uh, there's a balance there but you know we have to appreciate uh, and you know a zealous man at a time like this we say well I can't do the things I, I can't go door to door and I can't do everything I once did but a zealous man still just wants to please God so he's going to find a way and I even give Matthew some credit I think about uh, he's posting his testimony on Facebook you know he's going to find a way if you have a zeal to tell others about the Lord you find a way to do it and uh, so I just I see the zeal of Peter, and I gotta give him some praise for that. Yeah, um, I gotta hop back. I, I think it's honestly it's fitting that we kind of skipped over verse six because I think it is skipped over as one of the we don't see it as one of those you know jaw dropping type of scenes that we can't even imagine. I can't yeah. really imagine <laughs> Peter walking on water. I, mean, I you know imagine like something had to happen so that I just really can't imagine. I can imagine on TV but not live. Mm -hmm. You know, we see everything on TV. It's crazy. But, you know, live, I can't imagine it. I want to read verse 6. It says, As soon as soon then as he had said unto them, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground. I just can't imagine. Like, I can imagine a strong wind coming. But can you imagine <laughs> as Christ, getting like almost like goosebumps even talking about it, saying three words, I am he, and then literally they are just, you know, just thrown back onto the ground. Mm -hmm. It was not, God, Jesus used nothing else but his words and the power. Okay, so it means something when we hear about the Peter walking on water because it, it showed faith. Mm -hmm. I think I want this to mean as much as it means now. And what this means to me is it showed that Jesus, and I think we're going to talk about this a little bit later, but Jesus had, he wanted everybody to know there in reading that now, he did, he had the power to stop this mm -hmm. completely. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. He was not arrested. <laughs> right. He turned himself in, in a sense, and he wasn't guilty of anything, but he ordered all this mm -hmm. and allowed this because it just was a picture of this just shows you. It was the first time, you know, he says this, you know, first time they're asking him, because in verse seven, then they ask him again. And the first time they ask him, they are thrown back into the ground. So I just hope that Brad talked about, you know, make sure these scenes come alive to you. And so that one just came alive. And that's, and that's what I meant when I was reading that, that what's coming up because they're getting ready to bound him up. But, mm -hmm. you know, why would they even attempt that, <laughs> with, that with that power that he has? Yeah. But the fact that he let them bound him up is mm -hmm. clearly just him allowing it. It's oh, good. yeah. It's good. Yeah, I was just going to kind of get on that, right, that, that you know, um, when he said, I am he, I mean, that was, that was him giving Jesus giving a little glimpse mm -hmm. of his power. Mm -hmm. um, he didn't have to, you know, and I can relate. I can't imagine what went through the heads of those men, those soldiers who were there to take him at that time. Because when, you know, when in my line of work in law enforcement and corrections, I've had to take some people into custody that, if they didn't want me to take them into custody, I wasn't going to. Um, that's happened a few times. Um, but it's just amazing that here Jesus is once again displaying that I am willingly doing this. I don't have to do it this way. 
Um, yeah. But it was also to going to go ahead. No, go. Um, it was going to influence. <laughs> you know, when he said, um, "I've not lost any of them that you've given me." Mm-hmm. When he when he says, "I want," I, basically he says, "I want you to let these men go." These people, those guys were like, "Yeah, we're gonna." Yeah, you you guys go ahead and go. We're just gonna take him. You guys are good. Um, mm-hmm. I, I imagine they had to be scared to death at yeah. that time. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah, I think just the lesson Brad said. We're not gonna make. I told him we're not gonna make forty five minutes this video. I can guarantee. You. Too much <laughs> back and forth. We're I, I like this back and forth. I think it's gonna be good. But I think the lesson is that sometimes we we don't have the power of Christ or God necessarily. But I mean, obviously we have Him inside of us. But sometimes we have the power to tell somebody off. You know, we have the exact words. Yeah. We have the ammunition. We're finding ourselves on the Facebook probably more than we ever have. And mm-hmm. some of that is that we need to be a little bit to get the word out in our situation. But, you know, I looked the other day at a comment. I like, I have the power to tell this person right and tell them off a little bit. But, you know, I don't always have to show that power. I could, you know, be Christ-like. Mm-hmm. And say, you know what? I'm just going to show grace here, I'm, and that's going to cause more problems, and that, that's not going to, you know, further God's will for that person or me. And I think that's what Christ is a picture yeah. of here. Well, let me close out this scene. I think with with saying something we haven't even mentioned yet. That's even just even crazier is this thought that we just talked about the deity in a sense, the power of God of Jesus Christ when He just spoke, and they all fell down. But we haven't even mentioned the fact that Peter and Br- the zeal that Brian mentioned took that sword. Cut off Malchus's oh, ear, Jesus. and then Jesus is like, hold on a second, what are you doing? Picks the ear up, just puts it back yeah. on. I mean, you, if you're these soldiers, you just yeah. you just got taken back by words that made you fall. You're just point. now stumbling back up. You see an ear go flying off, and then you see this guy that you're supposed to arrest because he claims that he's God take an ear and put it back on. I mean, yeah. what do you do in this I'd scenario? I, I, and me, I, Brian would pass out. He cannot stand the sight of blood, so he'd be passed out on the side. But, I mean, at that point, you got to be thinking in your head, are we really supposed to be taking this guy? Yeah. But as it says several times in here, and I'm not bringing it up, maybe someone else will later, but it says that the Scripture may be fulfilled. Mm-hmm. Yes, they were to be taking that guy. They... And as you guys said, and then i got to wrap this up, they didn't have the power to take him. Yeah, <laughs> Jesus yeah. could wipe them out with just the spoke, with whatever he wanted to do. But he was, according to Scripture, letting Scripture being fulfilled, was submitting his life to be taken for us. So, neat first little bit of your verses in that first scene. So the first scene we've seen set up so far, Jesus comes down into the garden. Judas is going to betray him. Peter cuts off his ear. He puts it back on. But they do then take, probably with big bug eyes, but they do take Jesus and they begin to lead him. And when they lead him away, Matthew's going to read to us in a minute, There's they, they're leading him away and they've got to do a series of trials. He's going to start at this guy named Annas' his place. It's Caiaphas's father-in-law, if I get this right. He takes him first. And Matthew's going to read in a second, but as he's going to kind of interrogate Jesus informally. And in a sense, he's going to try to get him to give up some information that's going to implicate him. It's going to try to get Jesus to show that he's an enemy of the state, in a sense. And he wants to prove that both his doctrine and his disciples were anti-Roman because that would get him worthy of death. But he's going to strike out. So you're going to see, as you read, he's going to go to Caiaphas. And Caiaphas is going to kind of get assembly together. And they're going to try to find him guilty of, of uh, as far as the Jewish law, and we'll get to the Romans in a second. So Matthew's going to read for us uh, 12 through 14 and then 19 through 24. Right? Yeah, so just to skip around, just as Brad said, so we can see kind of how this is going. If, if you've never kind of looked at it like a harmony of the Gospels and seen how steps go, you know, how it all plays out, man, you need to see that. I'll do that. Brad does a little plug on his thing. I did a nine page paper the other night <laughs> on the last 24 hours before the cross. So if you want to see that, Shoot me an email. Um, I'll send that to you. But So I'm going to skip around here, as Brad said, and read these. It says in verse 12, Then the band and the captain and officers of the Jews took Jesus and bound him, and led him away to Annas first, for he was father-in-law to Caiaphas, which was the high priest that same year. And Peter stood with them. Uh, skip down to 19. Verse 14. 14, sorry. That's what we told Brad. We can't skip around, but now we're all off. Uh, it says, Now Caiaphas was he which gave counsel to the Jews 
that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. Let me just stop here and say real quick, it's so much easier to read when you know who you're reading about. So he mentioned that Annas was the father-in-law to Caiaphas. But then later, you're going to see us read, this is where it kind of gets confusing occasionally. Annas is referred to as the high priest, and um, Caiaphas is referred to as the high priest. Mm -hmm. Sometimes Annas is, you know, forgotten a little bit here, but he actually was, you know, the one that they went to for the final, you know, final authority. He was the one that ran the show. I, so Brian will make a joke about it that, you know, we call Pastor Brian and Pastor Wes, but in the end, Pastor Wes runs the show, all right? He may be called Pastor, but in the end, yeah. Pastor Wes runs the show. <laughs> they think not, but um, so it's just a, what they were saying is that they may have potentially been a high priest at the same time, but um, Annas was the final authority here, and um, Caiaphas may have been, been running some of the things along the side that are under him. All right, so skipping to verse 19, it says, The high priest, Annas, asked Jesus of, of his disciples and of his doctrine. Jesus answered him, I spake openly to the world I ever taught in the synagogue and in the temple, whither the Jews always resort, and in the secret I have said nothing. Why askest thou me? Ask them which heard me what I, what, what I have said unto them. Behold, they know what I said. And when he had thus spoken, one of the officers which stood by struck Jesus with the palm of his hand, saying, Answer thou the high priest so. Jesus answered him, If I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil. But if well, why smitest thou me? Now Annas had sent him bound unto Caiaphas the high priest. Am I continuing, Brad, or are we stopping there? If you got a thought, go ahead, and then we'll go to Brian Wall. I don't too. there. So, yeah. All right, so well, what we'll see to set the scene here again is... Jesus is now in the hands of the Jews. And that's important to remember because in a minute he'll go to the Romans. But right now he's being questioned by the Jews and he's in the hands of the Jews. Brian, take it over from there. For him. Uh, verse 28. Oh, are you going to read or <coughs> oh, you got a thought? No, yeah, no, I had a thought. Um, I, I, and I don't remember who I read this from. Um, but here uh, in verse 20 when he said that I spake openly to the world I ever taught in the synagogue and in the temple – um, Jesus and, and it's almost like, it was almost like they were trying to get him to admit to something that he that he did something that he really didn't do. Mm -hmm. um, you know, okay. they were trying to trap him. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, and but Jesus said, you know, I've I, I've I've conducted myself openly. Um, I've the same things I'm saying here. The same things I've been saying. To my to that I've been teaching the disciples and you know um, basically it was that, that Jesus conducted himself in such a way that he was blameless um, mm -hmm. he they couldn't they couldn't really they had nothing to stand on mm -hmm. uh, and but the, the it tied to that a little point of application that we should live our so our lives in such a way that um, one, it brings glory to the Father, but there's no denying who we are. You know, our actions outside of the church should match our actions when we're at the church, at the mm -hmm. building. Um, you know, Matthew five sixteen, let your light so shine before men that they'll see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Mm -hmm. So that was just kind of a little, a little uh, gem nugget, or no, you know, I said earlier in our first. text message, <laughs> I said a burrito because I really like burritos. You got burritos. Um, <laughs> right. so, be looking up here soon. Bible burritos with Brian. Um, it's not going to happen. But yeah, I just thought that was really neat. Um, I, I wish I could remember the name of the author I read that from, but I didn't write it down. So I was just going to be brief in there in this section, but you just see. Um, in this in this reading, they're doing all kinds of illegal things to Jesus. They're, uh, you know, Matthew read they they strike him. I mean, a blow to the face. Mm -hmm. They mm -hmm. they're doing this at a nighttime, which was illegal. It's it's between like two a.m. Yeah. and six a.m., uh, which was not legal. They're assuming his guilty. They're not allowing Jesus a defense. They're uh, they're hiring a, a false witness against him. The, the stories aren't straight, and so mm -hmm. just a lot of illegal stuff going on. But you never hear a complaint from Jesus. You never, you never see him calling for a retrial. He just, he trusts God through the trial, and and uh, you know I hope that brings some comfort to you during uh, your trial that he sees what's going on. He knows what's going on, and 
and he makes all things right in the end. So I mean, think good. about the humility of Jesus. Just I don't have it in my notes, but I want you guys to think about this. If I reached across the table right now and just backhanded Matthew, <laughs> what is he going to do? I mean, I say it jokingly, but what is he going to do? There's built in us as men, there's a pride that if I just decided to backhand you right now, camera rolling or not, there's a pride that builds up in him that's going to say, hey, I'm going to defend myself. And here's Jesus who has all the power again. Mm -hmm. But the humility that he has to when somebody, which that guy must not have been there at the in the garden whenever Jesus spoke and they all fell down and he cut his ear. But to have the humility when this guy smacks you to humble yourself and just probably look him in the eye and not 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 strike him down, turn him into something. Or whatever to turn the other cheek is just to me a lesson on humility because there's times when you want to respond to people mm -hmm. like you said earlier. Yeah. It's coming up again. <laughs> so, all right. So now Jesus has been questioned by the Jews and they find him guilty of death because he be, because he claims to be God. He claims to be the Messiah that the Jews were looking for. So that's all they need to hear to say he's guilty of death in our eyes. But they needed the approval of the Roman government, so they're going to send him to, before Pilate. And, and Brian's going to begin to read here. Uh, Brian Wald's going to begin to read verse 28 through 40, and he's going to read what happens before Pilate. So follow along. <clears throat> then led they, they Jesus from Caiaphas unto the hall of judgment. And it was early, and they themselves went not into the judgment hall, lest they should be defiled, but <clears throat> that they might eat the Passover. Pilate then went out unto them and said what accusation bring ye against this man <clears throat> they answered and said unto him if he were not a malefactor we would not have delivered him unto thee then said Pilate unto them take ye him and judge him according to your law the Jews therefore said unto him it is not lawful for us <clears throat> to put any man to death that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled which he spake sign signifying what death he should die <clears throat> Then Pilate entered into the judgment hall again, and called Jesus, and said unto him, Art thou king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, says, answered him, Sayest thou this thing of thyself, or did others tell it to thee of me? Pilate answered, I am, <clears throat> am I a Jew? Thine own nation the ch and the chief priests have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews, but now is my kingdom not from hence. Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. <clears throat> to this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Every one, every one that is of the truth heareth my voice. Pilate saith unto him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews, and saith unto them, I find in him no fault at all. But ye have a custom that I should release unto you one at the Passover. Will ye therefore that I release unto you the king of the Jews? Then cried they all again, saying, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. <clears throat> all right, so we see the scene now. The Jews bring him and hand him off to the Romans. And Pilate says, What are you bringing this guy here for? And they said, If he wasn't a malefactor, we wouldn't have brought him. He's a He's a... Evil he's doer, yeah. he's an evil doer. Yeah. He's guilty in our eyes, and so um, he d deserves this. So Pilate takes him, questions him, and basically says, "I don't see anything wrong with this guy." He asks him the classic question. Maybe somebody get into. He says, "What is truth?" Because Jesus said, "I've come to bear witness of the truth." Some may want to talk about that. I don't know. And then he says, I don't see anything wrong with this guy. And he said, but there is a custom. And we're missing out some of it in the Gospels. We haven't bounced around, but he goes before Herod, I believe, and then back to Pilate. And Pilate says, I don't see anything, but I, but the custom is on this Passover, I'll release one prisoner. So what do you guys want me to release, Jesus, or do you want me to release somebody else? And they pick Barabbas. So there's the scene again, guys. We've read it. We've summarized it. Any thoughts on these verses you want to mention? I'll go all the way back to verse 28 where he started just – it brought conviction on this little thought here when they then they they brought Jesus uh, that would be the chief priests the elders the scribes these Jews they're bringing Jesus and their purpose remember is to take an innocent man and put him to death 
But yet it says there in verse 28 that they, they themselves went not into the judgment hall. So to be ceremonially clean, because it was seen to them in the religious terms as defilement to, to, to go in and to eat with a Gentile or to, be, to touch a Gentile was defilement. So under the name of religion, they, they did not go into the judgment hall yet. And I don't love the word hypocrisy. I think it gets used too much. But, uh, but the hypocrisy here is, is they're trying to be religious by not going in and defiling themselves. But all the while, they're about to put an innocent man to death. That was their purpose. And it just the conviction, the thought is, how do, how do we, how do I uh, try to get away with sin and still look spiritual? You know, are there times in your life where you're trying to get away with sin in your life? but still looks spiritual on the outside. And so convicting thought, they are frustrating as you read it, but you think, well, we do the same thing sometimes. Yeah, that's good. Anyone else? Yeah, I was, from the perspective of Pilate, you know, what we learned from, you know, him and, you know, just thinking about, you brought up truth. You know, I don't think you can, nobody can read Pilate and feel like Pilate mm -hmm. knows the truth. Mm -hmm. Jesus is innocent. You know, Jesus, that's the truth. But yeah, and he knew what the right thing to do. He even had his wife, you know, telling him, I had a dream, you know, stay away, do not be a part of this at all. He knew all the right things. He knew all the truth. And then at the end of this, you know, we'll get to this maybe next week, you know, he says, you know, my, my hands are clean. I wash myself of this, you know, pretty much says, I'm not the one who is going to stand before God. And can I tell you, he is going to stand before God and account for that. You know, James 417 says, therefore to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. I think a lot of times we just step back and say, you know what, I couldn't really reach those people. You know, I was on the coronavirus shutdown. I, I had no way to pass it. And I, I had one of these pants in a while. I picked them up. I saw two tracks in my pocket. It was almost like remembering a world of years ago when I tried passing out tracks. I don't feel like it's appropriate necessarily to hand things to strangers at this point. So, you know, but... We're going to stand before God and give an account for, Brian talked about sins that you were doing, but also the sin because we didn't do what we knew was right and was convicted in our heart to do. And so just a picture, and I mean, we've all heard messages about Pilate almost doing the right thing, but it doesn't count almost doing right. You need to go all the way through and do right. I want to think of this quick contrast. I just thought about it when you were talking earlier. I made the point about Jesus having known what was going to come, what what was the pain that was there. He still chose what what he went forth. He did what was right. Here's Pilate knows or anticipates what could come. If I say that he's innocent and let him go, I may lose in the next political election. I may yeah. lose. I may get pain. <laughs> I may get stoned. I may get to. And so he knew what could happen and he chose fear and selfishness yeah. jesus knew what was coming he chose love Sacrifice. and submission uh so i think that's an interesting contrast there and too brian do you have a thought on barabbas i thought um yeah i did it you know here here barabbas is is you know here at the end it says that he was a robber so um you know clearly we automatically think of this evil scumbag um, and I, I read a few different things on him, um, you know, where uh, it's believed that he was, there's, there's two schools of thought on it, two different thoughts that um, some believe, he, it says he's a robber, okay, but it doesn't really, we have a perceived notion of what that means. But these other writers, you know, some say, you know, say he was a terrorist and a murderer. And, uh, but then, you know, when you watch a movie, that's what you, you, you he's portrayed as. Uh, but then there's also some that have, and I'm not trying to, teach heresy or contradict scripture but they believe that maybe he was like a freedom fighter um you know he was he was he had actually fought against rome to try to liberate the jewish people um so um you know there's that mm. thought of it um but with that and i'm taking a little bit of liberty here but with that um i think it it shows that no matter where you lie on the spectrum of of who you are as a person, that we all are in need of a savior. Mm -hmm. um, you know, because he, and, and Jesus is that savior. Um, you know, the man that didn't need forgiveness took the place 
of the man who desperately needed it. Barabbas was going to die. Um, he was going to. There's no question about it. He was going to die, whether it was because he was a criminal, um, because he was a thief, or because he was a criminal because he was going against Rome. Um, so, you know, here he needed that. No matter, it, it doesn't matter who you are, what walk of life you come from, we need Christ, um, and, and I thought it's just just a wonderful, wonderful picture. And um, Barabbas's name actually means "son of the father," Bar meaning son, and then the last part coming from Abba, which means father. Um, and there's also a belief, uh, uh, an idea that maybe his name actually was Jesus. Also, um, but I didn't really get into that too much. Um, but just, uh, I thought, you know, this is a beautiful, beautiful picture of, of salvation. Mm-hmm. Uh, here, here's someone who is condemned and guilty just like we are. Man. Yeah. Amen. Mm-hmm. And again, willingly. Yeah. It didn't yeah. have to be done this way. No. But he, willingly. Yeah, it was definitely willingly, as we've said and emphasized throughout yeah. this time. Now, we've been through two scenes so far. But in the concluding part of the first scene, we left Peter, and he had a sword in his hand, maybe some blood on his garment still (laughs) from the ear of Malchus, and we kind of left him there, and then Jesus was taken away by the Jews. What happened to Peter? And so we're going to come to scene three now, the final scene, and we're going to see what happened to him actually was exactly what Jesus predicted would happen, which shows, again, the sovereignty of Jesus Christ. In When he said, I am, they fell down, the healing of Malchus's ear, and in the prediction of what was going to happen to Peter. So let me read, starting verse number 15. It says, And Simon Peter followed Jesus, and did, and so did another disciple. Another disciple, there's probably John, he usually refers to himself in that context, Somebody tried to make an argument for Nicodemus. I won't get into that, but I think it was probably John. That's how he consistently referred to himself. It says, That disciple was known unto the high priest and went in with Jesus into the palace of the high priest. But Peter stood at the door without. Then went out that other disciple, which was known unto the high priest, and spake unto her that kept the door and brought in Peter. Then saith the damsel that kept the door unto Peter, Art not thou one of this man's disciples? And he saith, I am not. Uh-oh, what's that? That's denial number, number one. one. I'm keeping number score one. at home. If we're keeping score at home, I know you don't know what's coming. Denial number one. That brings us back to earlier. Jesus, won, Jesus said Peter. that this would happen. But could things change? Verse 18. And the servants and the officers stood there who had made a fire coals, for it was cold. And they warmed themselves, and Peter stood with them and warmed himself. Now, we're going to jump to verse 25. And it says, And Simon Peter stood and warmed himself. They said therefore to him, Art not thou also one of his disciples? He denied it and said, I am not. That is number two times he denied it. Now, What's going to happen? Because Jesus said a few hours earlier, hey, you're going to deny me. That was one of the surprises early in the upper room when everybody's like, whoa. But now verse 26, mm-hmm. one of the servants of the high priest being his kinsman, whose ear Peter cut off, so he's related to Malchus, saith, did not I see thee in the garden with him? Mm-hmm. Peter then denied again the third time and immediately the cock crew, which is exactly what Jesus said would happen. Again, showing his deity. What do you got on this, Brian? Oh. Sound like you're warming up for it. I thought he was ready. No, 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 no. Okay, he it's just time to pick up. Uh, this is that time where we pick on Peter and Matthew. I know is loaded up. So <laughs> yeah, I, 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 Brian texted earlier and talked about he had, he could write a whole sermon on the zeal of Peter, and and he's right. You know, we could learn so much. We sometimes Peter does get picked on. Um, But I think it's just a perfect picture of a life that Christ put in to the Bible. Just like David, he didn't leave out the sin of Bathsheba with the story of David. He puts out the whole life there because he knows we can learn. But Peter's strength was his zeal. He most definitely had a zeal, and he was able to do things that no other disciple did. 
and I think somebody's going to speak on what he was able to do. He probably did more as a disciple after Christ went to the cross and, and was resurrected and ascent, ascended into heaven than any other disciple because of his strength. But his weakness, I believe, his struggle was obedience. Think of how, how much it would take to have the zeal to do something, but how little is it to just obey over and over. You know, um, Christ tells Peter, I'm going to go to the cross. Peter literally rebukes Jesus and says, no, you're not. Yeah. Christ says, get, get behind me, Satan. You know what I mean? You're, you're telling me I'm not? He, he tells Peter, just stay awake and, and pray. I'm going to go over here and pray. He comes back. Peter's asleep. So he's like, when I wanted you to be, you know, going, you, you know, were sleeping. Then later he says, you know, be still. I'm going to give myself to these men. He cuts off the ear. You know, mm -hmm. and then the last one, he, he tells him that where I go, you cannot follow who's following after Christ when they, when they take him, Peter. Mm -hmm. So it's just, you know, I'm not trying to get on Peter too much because I think we can lear learn so much about the zeal, but I think many times those Christians that are doing quite a bit for the Lord, we forget to just daily obey. Mm -hmm. I mean, we need to read our Bibles. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's the same old, same old. You need to pray every day. You need to read your Bible every day. Every decision, you know, just a shout out to my wife. I feel like, you know, my prayer life was going in the right direction. We did some prayer challenges. But where she has helped me is just the small, like literally praying without ceasing. I, I have literally prayed before going into shop now. I thought that was like, like, what do you mean? We're just going into Kohl's. I don't want to. But I literally did that once going into a goodwill. And got the exact thing that I prayed for. Now, could Brian have got the same thing? Yes, but just to use him, I'm not saying he didn't pray, but he wouldn't have been able to go to that car praising the Lord. He would have went to the car with the same chair and the same deal. Mm -hmm. I got to go in that situation because I prayed before. So I just think we could learn a lot, not picking on Peter, but just God put it there for a reason for us to understand. It's just those were little things. The great thing, he walked on water. He did all those things. But he forgot about the little things. I think we forget also sometimes. Yeah, this is uh, certainly Peter's denial. This is his low point. And, I mean, think about it. How would you like to have your worst moment, uh, <laughs> us broadcast it tomorrow when we when we air <laughs> our Sunday service? I mean, uh, how would you like, or today, I guess you're watching on Sunday. I don't yeah. know what it is. But, uh <laughs> You think about Abraham's lie, and you think about Noah's drunkenness, and Moses mm -hmm. with the Egyptian and, and mm -hmm. murder, and David's lust, and uh, everybody has these a worse moment like that, and we could all relate. That's why Peter's so relatable. Um, but the good news is he bounced back, and the good news is God gave him a second chance, and and uh, he ends up, as you read on in your scripture, he he ends up carrying the gospel all the way to Rome. And he's crucified upside down um, for his faith. And so he finishes strong. He turns it around. He gets a second chance. Uh, I read about, I love the song, Come Thou Fount, one of our hymnals. Mm -hmm. And uh, the guy that wrote that, Robert Robinson, you know, in that song, it, it says, prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Well, he did wonder. The guy that wrote the song did mm -hmm. wonder after he wrote the song. He wandered away from God like the prodigal son. Uh, and it was when he was on a stagecoach next to a woman she did not know who he was, but she said, what do you think about the words, prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love? And he broke down weeping and said, you know, uh, uh, here's what he said. Uh, he said, I am the poor, unhappy man who wrote that hymn, and I would give a thousand worlds to enjoy the feelings I had then. Uh, now, I didn't, I didn't read the rest of the story. I don't know if he did bounce back. I don't know. God got his attention there, and but I don't know if he took advantage of that. But I'm just thankful for a God that gives us opportunity after opportunity. And I know Peter, he took advantage of it. Uh, and uh, and so we celebrate, you know, the Pentecost, the start of the church, 3,000 people saved. He was preaching. Um, so what a, what a turnaround he did, mm -hmm. but definitely made some mistakes along the way here. Yeah. Um, I think those are both great, great... Uh, Counts there for Peter. I'm gonna beat him up a little bit <laughs> some more. Um, just just because I I can relate with Peter um, a lot, um, especially like with the tendency to open my mouth and insert my foot. Sometimes <laughs> I say things before I think about it. Um, but <clears throat> I think uh, Peter here 
illustrates uh, Psalm 1-1. You know, when it says, uh, what I wrote it down, hang on. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Um, it's, it's really, it's a matter of Peter was in the wrong place at the wrong time and with the wrong people. Um, you know, like Matthew pointed out, <laughs> Jesus told him to begin with, don't follow me. Mm-hmm. And he did it anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and, and because he followed him, then he found himself around this crowd of people uh, in this group of people where he really couldn't speak up and say who he really was mm-hmm. because now he's afraid that they might kill him too yeah. mm-hmm. um, or whatever he was afraid of. Um, but, you know, and even... Even when John went and got him and brought him in, um, he still struggled to, 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 you know, to be truthful about who he was. Um, and, and just because it's, it's a good thought of that, you know, who are we spending the bulk of our time with? Who, uh, you know, who, who are the people that we are, or who are we letting influence us that we think we're actually influencing, but we're really not. Um, you know, it's it's easy to think we're good and we're we're making a difference in, in people's lives, but when actually, you know, we it, it's easier for them to pull us down than it is to, for us to pull them up. Mm-hmm. Um, so you know, there's this progression of you start walking the wrong direction because of disobedience, mm-hmm. um, and then the next thing you know, you're you're in the wrong company. Um, you know, you're in, you're standing and hanging around a little mm-hmm. bit longer than you should have. And then the next thing you know, you're sitting down, rubbing elbows, having dinner, uh, you know, warming yourself at the fire. You know, yeah. um, so I just thought that was a a good illustration of Psalm one one. Um, so there's the the junior high teaching um, for the for the young people. Um, you know, watch out who you're hanging out with, there and for adults too. Oh, we yeah. have to watch who we're spending the bulk of our time yeah, with. Sure. Um, Amen. You know, we we can we can have friends and family that aren't saved. And while we love them and we still want to be around them, we have to watch how much we're letting them influence us. Here's my thought, maybe concluding, unless you guys get some other thoughts here. I have been wrestling with this. I sent these guys a group text message yesterday saying, I I want to figure this out, and I haven't figured it out. And if I get to heaven one day and get to talk to Peter, I want to sit him down on a couch, and I want to question him and just say, all right, what, what was going on here? And, and not in a bad way, but I really want to know because in, in, in hours marked the difference between when Peter had a warrior spirit and he took out a sword and he was, whether he was going for the ear and he has great aim or going for the head and he's got terrible aim, <laughs> I don't know, but he cut off Malchus's ear. I mean, warrior-like spirit. I don't even know that I could do that. I, I mean, but Peter had that zeal that Brian talked about. And in a matter of hours, he's full of fear and denying. So he's full of faith one moment, and hours later full of fear. And if I could sit him down on the couch right now, I want to know the psyche behind it. Like, what, what changed? I mean, there was people here and there was people here. It was you. Why are you afraid of these people and not these people? What is it? I don't have the answer. I wish I did. But the answer, the, the application, though, that came to me is this. That just shows how fragile faith is. Mm -hmm. Not saving faith, but living by faith. We could get done with this lesson today, and I'm pumped up right now, and I could high-five these guys and then get in my car, and my wife say something I don't like, and immediately I get in my flesh, Mm -hmm. and all of a sudden I go from high-fiving these guys Mm -hmm. to in my flesh. See, faith uh, is such a fragile thing that we've got to constantly be on guard. And I'm reminded back when Jesus, earlier in this night, when he said to these disciples and to Peter, he said, watch and pray, lest you, mm-hmm. you fall into temptation. Yeah. And what did he do? He, they fell asleep. And we've constantly got to be on guard of our faith and allow and growing in grace. I've been studying on that this week because faith is a fragile thing. And fear can creep up and, and, and starve our faith, living by faith, mm-hmm. if we're not careful. And we could be a war, have a warrior spirit at one moment and be denying Jesus the next moment if we're not careful. And so I didn't get the answer that I, I was hoping to get, but it did show me how important it is to grow in grace and to continue to feed our faith because it's a fragile thing and fear wants to rob us of living by faith. Mm-hmm. All right, guys, we're kind of coming to the end. Any other final thoughts? I just think that final thing of just a you know quick plug too of, of feelings. You know, we talked yeah. before. We you can't control how you feel tomorrow morning, but you can control what you do with it. And I think right. 
just a plug for Brian on the Sunday night message. I, you know, most of you have probably watched this maybe before the Sunday night message, and he's dealing with emotions. It's one of my favorite books, you know, that he's pulling some of the things from with Bud Calvert, you know. Um, now I can't even think of my favorite title of Emotional it. Emotional victory. Emotional victory. Yeah, Great amazing what you forget, <laughs> you know, up here. Um, but you know, what, it was actually um, we did a book study with the guys, and so uh, definitely watch that because you know I tell my even some of the teens I work with, you know, you cannot control how you feel, but you can control what you do with that feeling. Right. Mm-hmm. And you could see Peter, you know, he, he in that moment he couldn't have victory over that feeling of fear. So mm-hmm. just the last thought. All right, there's so much I can't recap. We've we've covered a lot of ground and a lot of application. So I hope that you'll take it in, think through these. I hope maybe you were taking notes during this. Next week's Easter service, we're not going to necessarily have a Sunday school out early or, or as far as Sunday morning, but we are going to try to post something on Good Friday. We're going to try to get together this week and get something together. I think on Chapter 19, we deal with the cross and give you a short thought on the cross leading up to Easter, Resurrection Sunday. So thank you for joining us today. Why don't we just close together in a time of prayer. Our Father, we love you and we thank you for first loving us. We thank you for even knowing what you were about to face on that cross, going forth and dying for our sins. And God, we're so thankful that uh, just the time that we've been able to study and it, how this text has impacted our life, and we're thankful for those that are listening. And I pray that the overflow from our study would be to help and encouragement in their walk with God, with you. And Lord, I do pray that you would just continue to unify our church, build our church, even in these unique times. And God, help us to keep our eyes upon you. Thank you for our time. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.